The NEA's first big grant was helping us tour. And that support, touring support, stayed with us right through to the 80s. It was an amazing thing. It was an amazing time for, for dance. I felt that touring assistance program was a large part of it. In the 90s and on till now, the NEA's focusing on the creations of new works, the things that will redefine the art form, the things that we might in fact be claiming will be the Swan Lake a hundred years from now, that we, the NEA and ABT, created together. That's Kevin McKenzie, the Artistic Director of American Ballet Theatre. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. 2015 is a banner year for both American Ballet Theatre and the National Endowment for the Arts. ABT is marking its 75th anniversary, while the NEA is celebrating its 50th. As you heard from Kevin, our relationship goes way back. ABT received the very first grant ever given by the National Endowment for the Arts. Although always a brilliant and innovative ballet company, ABT was going through some rough financial waters 50 years ago, and the NEA gave it an emergency grant to ensure the company's immediate survival. And then the endowment gave ABT an additional grant toward the expenses of touring the United States. And those tours helped foster an appreciation throughout the country for ABT and for ballet itself. Ballet theater, as it was originally known, began as a small, struggling collective, determined to put an American mark on dance. It did that and much, much more. ABT is now one of the most respected dance companies in the world, as renowned for its contemporary work as it is for its dazzling, full-length classical ballets. ABT is a rarity in its stability. Over the course of its 75 years, it's had only three artistic directors. And what a trio they are. Founder, Lucia Chase, Mikhail Baryshnikov, and Kevin McKenzie. These three, each in his or her own way, have overseen a company that honors the great tradition of dance as it pursues and nurtures innovative talent that continues to push the art form forward. According to Kevin McKenzie, this insistence on the vitality of dance can be traced to Lucia Chase's vision for the company and the collaborations she sought to bring it to fruition. She had a unique vision for this. I have to give credit to Richard Pleasant too. It was him as the first official director that took all the energy that she had and all these ideas and focused them into this unique beast we call ballet theater. And it was that it should have wings. It should encompass many types of dance. It should not be a single choreographer's vision. And beyond that, it shouldn't even be one genre of dance's vision. What they needed was a really versatile group of dancers who could, in fact, do it all. It was such a radical thing for any dance company to do at that time, especially a big international scale ballet company. All the national ballet companies like the Royal Ballet, the Bolshoi, they all grew out of schools and a style, a particular style that became emblematic of a national heritage. ABT started from the reverse. It didn't come from a school. It came from the very notion of the American experiment that we all come as a national character from all walks of life and from all ethnic backgrounds. Hence, in that first year, she, to quote Agnes DeMille, she invited every choreographer who was worth anything, who was any good at all, and they all came. I don't remember the number right at this moment, but it was something like 18 choreographers or 15 choreographers that very first season. It was unheard of. And they ranged from established Russian tradition like Mikhail Fokin to radical American newbies like Eugene Loring. And then she took, I think, the most daring step, and it was to engage Anthony Tudor as the resident choreographer, if you will. You know, it it was a very unique thing. And Kevin, what about the name, which is unusual for a dance company? Ballet theater. That's right. Ballet theater coined a phrase. People who don't know anything about ballet. If you say the word a theater piece or a theater event or an art installation, what you're describing is an event. If you say ballet theater, 
why not ballet company? <laughs> why not American Ballet Company? And it was it was called Ballet Theater because it wanted to use the vocabulary of ballet in the context of theater, which reflects the times in which you live. And this was made in 1940. I think she captured at a moment in time our national character in this ballet company. When did ABT begin adding full-length classical ballets to its repertoire? Do you, do you know that that didn't come until the NEA's first big grant? I did not know that. Yeah, that's true. The company existed for its first 20 plus years entirely on repertory works of various genres as, you know, as I just discussed. We did do a Giselle, but we had never done anything from the classical canon as a big full-length ballet until the 60s when Lucia decided we're going to do Swan Lake. And that was huge because it coincided roughly with the time that the NEA grant came to us. We were on our knees. <laughs> we were about to disband and it was the turnaround moment because suddenly we claimed that without having an official designation that we were the nation's ballet company. We were the nation's classical ballet company. We were going to take on Swan Lake, Petit Pas, you know, the emblem of what classical ballet is. And it changed our course. That was also the moment in time when we added the name American to our title. So there was a convergence of circumstances and a moment in history when that grant came to us and Eisenhower had already planted the seed that we should start to use the name American since we were doing state-supported tours to foreign countries and couldn't sustain ourselves. Then the NEA grant came in to save the day and then Lucia mounted Swan Lake and our fortunes changed forever. Do you think Lucia was on to something? What made her think going to classical ballet? was the way to go. Do you have any any clue about that, Kevin? I think it was uh, I think it was because Swan Lake is an emblem of classical ballet and classical ballet is the standard of measure by which you can measure not your uniqueness against other national ballet companies, but what does excellence actually mean? And here we were, the American company and didn't have that in our repertoire. So how could we claim ourselves to be an international serious force for dance? And I think that's why she chose it. And the truth of the matter is, through time, if you fast forward now 20 years to the 80s, the company quickly had added literally the full canon of classical petit pas ballets. And indeed, it did become the standard of measure of how American dance stood in the world. But the thing that was still at that time unique was that ballet theater now not only did the classics and did them on a standard that, that put us on the world stage, we were still unique in our choice of repertoire that encompassed genre crossing works. Anthony Tudor broke all grounds with coining the phrase psychological ballet. Agnes DeMille and Jerome Robbins, you know, emerged with and from the company and crossed the lines to Broadway. There was something incredibly unique about the versatility. It was hard to suddenly come the 80s when Lucia passed the baton to Mikhail Baryshnikov. It became very difficult to say, what is a ballet theater dancer? The easy answer was versatile. By the time I came along as a director and was asked that question, I said, you know, the thing is, we are no longer now unique in the world because all the other companies have tried to copy our model in that you have to do the classics because that's a standard of measure, but you have to do innovative work to see where the art form is going to go. The fact that ABT had been doing that from its inception didn't give us necessarily exclusivity to doing that. But what was different and made us unique to describe what a ballet theater dancer was, was the training. When you looked at a Russian dancer, it was unmistakably a Russian dancer. They had been trained in a very grand style. And, and if you looked at a, at a French dancer, it was very precise. And you looked at an English dancer, and it was very reserved. And you looked at an American dancer, and it didn't have a physical look, but it had an energetic appeal that was palpable. And that is what made us and keeps us unique in the world. Well, your dancers, they're primarily American, but they do come from around the world. They come from all over the world. And, you know, the thing is, is that we created what I guess would be called an American style based on that energy that I just talked of, because we had 
Cuban trained dancers standing next to Russian trained dancers standing next to you know British and French trained dancers and a bunch of you know wily Americans and they all learned from each other and eventually the Russians were no longer Russian and the Cubans were no longer Cuban because they were taking what was the best of their trainings and what they observed and how each other worked and a new thing was made exactly the way this country was established the patchwork that's America yeah exactly yeah yeah exactly Every art form is unique, so not to be trite or overstate it, but ballet, to me most particularly, is so paradoxical because the, the, the gracefulness and the effortlessness that one sees on the stage is dependent on this extraordinary strength that in some ways has to be masked. You know, I think the thing that's unique about it and why it, where it separates itself in physicality from sports is that... <clears throat> Where the similarities lie is that the conditioning has to be extreme, like many sports are. The physicality and the strength of the body has to be integral and all-encompassing, as it is also needed in sports. In ballet, it then you put one more layer on top of that. It's not a competition. There is no one who wins or loses at the end of it, but it is trying to achieve excellence for the sake of excellence, with the objective to communicate the human condition and celebrate the human form. Ultimately, the thing that really sets it apart is that it has to be beautiful. <laughs> At all times, it has to be beautiful. Th there was a very interesting thing that Anthony Tudor once said to me when trying to portray a particular jump. And I thought he wanted me to do the jump physically better. It took me a while for me to understand that what he wanted for me was to say something with that jump. And he said, listen, it's time for you to trust your training. It will be beautiful and as beautiful as it needs to be, but it doesn't need perfection at this moment. It needs to be dramatic. That's one of the great artists as a director, <laughs> working on everyday stuff. That's what ballet dancers work on every day. How did you come to dance? Totally accidentally. A little bit the um, Billy Elliot story. At the grand old age of seven years old, I had a friend who was taking some tap lessons and was excited by them and was explaining them to me and trying to get me to go and join him. And I was like, eh, I don't know. And my father overheard the conversation. And he was not particularly into the arts, but he said, well, what the hell, boy? Go, go join him. Who knows? You could be the next Fred Astaire. So I did. I went and took the tap lessons with my friend. And a while later, my father wanted to see what I knew, and I was not terribly good. And he said, hmm, why don't you take your sister's ballet class? They send football players to ballet class for coordination and strength, you know? Maybe it's just that you're not coordinated. And I, I really resisted that. I did not want to put on a pair of tights and get in a room with a bunch of girls. And the teacher was very good, worked with my parents, and said, I'll give him a couple of private classes with just his sister. And if he can't deal with it, then, you know, don't push him. And so they did that. And there was something about it. It was something about the relation to music and how it felt physically to do that within a month or so, I was OK going to the girls' ballet class. And within a year or two, I was giving up the basketball team and the acrobatics team and the tap dance lessons and all of it. And my parents were looking at each other going, whoa, what have we uh, wrought here? And then, just like in the Billy Elliot story, my teacher went to my parents and said, this kid, you know, and the sister are really talented and they should go get some tr real training. They're, you know, they're beyond my pay grade. And so she helped my parents look for good teachers. And we were incredibly fortunate to be accepted at the Washington School of Ballet uh, with Mary Day, who at the time was in Washington, D.C., and had an academy and, and a dormitory situation where, you know, she trained kids through their high school years with a mind to be professional dancers. And the academic courses all related to a life in the theater. It was remarkable training. And so at the grand old age of 12, I went off to school and I stayed there until high school, until I finished my high school training and in essence completed my ballet training and got my first job in Washington, D.C. with the National Ballet of Washington. And then you went on to the Joffrey. That's right. And then on to ABT and and you were hired by Lucia. I was. I have to correct past statements. I have been on record saying I was her last hire, and I'm not so sure that I was, but I know that I was her last promotion. She hired me in, in March of 79, and in December of 79, 
she um, promoted me. Now that's a very quick promotion to principal, isn't it? It was. It was a very quick promotion. But I had had a lot of experience by that time. And, you know, it's interesting. I had said to myself, I auditioned for ballet theater when I left Washington, and it was the year that Mikhail Baryshnikov defected and had his first performances in New York, so I literally couldn't get in the door. So I suppose it could be explained that I, my time at Joffrey was a detour, because I always wanted to be at Ballet Theatre, but I, I wouldn't have traded that experience at Joffrey for anything, because what it gave me was what I probably wouldn't have gotten in my formative years at Ballet Theatre, and it's what made me completely ready to be promoted as quickly as I was when I got to Ballet Theatre. So Lucia left, and Baryshnikov became the artistic director. What did he bring to ABT? When Misha became director, we were in at the height of what's called the ballet boom. Dance was in general society's lexicon. Mikhail Baryshnikov was a household word. Makarova and Nareyev were steady attractions. Gelsey Kirkland was the first American ballerina to be on the cover of Time magazine. And the money was flowing. It was just the height of the, of the game. And what he brought was a sort of recognition that ballet had come into its own as a profession. And that, you know, for the general public, it was okay to go see the ballet. It wasn't necessarily just for those people who, oh, maybe also see the opera. And as I say, that was the height of the NEA's support for touring. And we went every single year for 16, anywhere between 12 and 16 weeks on the road before we came and did an eight-week season at the Met. And literally went everywhere. It was a phenomenal thing. As a performer, it was an amazing thing because it, it afforded you so many performances. As an institution, it allowed us to cement our reputation in the country to become the de facto national ballet company. And he brought in many, many contemporary choreographers of the, of the time, and he added to our repertoire in the classical canon. He did his own production of Nutcracker. He did our first production of Don Q, brilliant staging of Giselle. And, you know, he brought Kenneth Macmillan to us, and with it, the Royal Ballet has it also, but we have the his, Kenneth's production of Romeo and Juliet, Twyla Tharp, and she created more works than any other choreographer. So it was a very exciting time and a burst of creativity and a burst of activity and, and we were all riding the high that ballet had come into its own, you know. And then came the end of the 80s <laughs> and our whole world changed. Yeah. It changed for the NEA and it changed for ABT and, you know, the NEA's budget was slashed and so was ABT's and our fortunes changed and we kind of had to rebuild at the moment in time that I came in as director. Did you expect to become artistic director? I did was not. Was it something you had thought about? No. It was a shocking moment in time. Without being self-deprecating and without painting a bad picture about anyone, basically what happened is that anyone with any experience or knowledge about how to run a big ballet company was not about to touch ABT with a 10-foot pole. And I ended up with a job because I was known here at ABT. The dancers were very supportive of it. And basically, because of my relative lack of experience and as an administrator and my unknown track record of a, as a director, the company had nothing to lose by giving me a try because no one else was going to do it. We were, the choice was me or shut the place down. And, and the reason because of that was because of financial difficulties, We were correct? in such dire financial straits. It was just, it had eroded so quickly and so fast, as is the fate of artistic institutions in America. It only takes three or four key people who are either funders or star performers or good administrators to leave at the same time and a place can go out of existence. So I just, you know, I started the way I knew best and had some severe on-the-job training. And because every single person in this institution wanted me and needed me to succeed, I did. What is it that you wanted to bring to the company? Financial stability aside, which I know is nothing to sneeze at, but artistically. I felt that at the time I took the, the company, it needed to go a little bit back to its roots. It needed to rediscover the theater part of its roots. But ultimately, I felt that there was nothing wrong with its mission. I wanted to continue the tradition of expanding the classical repertoire 
and expanding relationships with, with uh, very high-end choreographers and trying to explore new creators to promote them for, you know, where's the art form going to go in the future? So it was really less about what I thought I could do for it, but how I thought I could do for it. And I think it was really just the sobering moment in time that I came in. I, I had to say to everybody, hey guys, just because we're ballet theater doesn't mean we deserve to survive. And we all have to remember that. <laughs> we're literally only as good as our last performance now. You know, it's, it doesn't matter that we have a great history because that's just the way it is in America. We have to earn our way out of this. Everybody went, okay, great. How do we do that? <laughs> and, and I just set about programming one the company ballet one time. ballet at a time, build it one ballet at a time, exactly. You know, well, ballet dancers are performers, which means among other things, it's a jumble of ego and insecurity. So as artistic director, you both have to nurse fragile egos and also, I would think, sometimes foster a little humility. That's, that's quite a juggle. It is. But I think that, I think that there was, a, the, I was lucky in that when I came in, there was a generational turnaround also. I had an, a, a unique situation in that I was suddenly directing people in the principal ranks that six, eight months prior had been my partners on stage but they were all beginning the ending years of their careers. So I was able to set my sights on new talent and build an entirely new generation within about five years and set the stamp of the expected behavior on that new generation. And that's the one that brought us into the late 90s and a new culture had been sort of introduced into ABT that, you know, basically, for better or for worse, you guys all have to understand that you have a director who grew up in a very large family and... I'm used to organized chaos, but one of the really unifying things is that when you've got that many people to take care of, we don't have time for your ego. We have work to do, and we'll respect you and your talent, but we don't have time for your ego. And it's not okay to act out. And it was just a credo. And, you know, it didn't mean people didn't act out, but they knew that, you know, <laughs> we were either not going to put up with it or there just wasn't time for it. You know? That's funny, because one of my questions was, does being, <laughs> does being one of 11 kids, did that prepare you for a life in a ballet company? You know, it, company? Took, it took me almost 10 years of directing to suddenly realize the shock of recognition in that statement. But I do, in retrospect, I, I absolutely believe that's one of the keys to my longevity here, is that I've been preparing for this since I, obviously, from a sociological viewpoint, uh, <laughs> for my entire life. <laughs> ABT also made headlines when Misty Copeland was promoted to principal dancer, mm. the first African-American woman in ABT's history to be principal dancer. Yeah. I know ABT has engaged with outreach to diversify its dancers. Can yeah. you tell me about some of those efforts that you've made? Well, you know, it, it became apparent to us when, we, when our school started to really develop and we, we had all these summer schools and all over the country. So we audition broadly and see lots of kids in the audition process. And we began to discover two things. One was that the training in America out there was not what it should be. And what training there was, was not terribly diversified. So we kind of through time, we developed this national training curriculum to teach the teachers. So we, we instituted this training curriculum. And then the next step was trying to reach and address the diversity issue. So black people are excluded because mostly they don't have the opportunity to train young enough to get good enough at an early age to be seen at ABT's level. So how do we address that? And we set about doing outreaches to schools around the country. We established a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of America, which is where Misty was discovered, by the way, and have entered into the, those communities through local ballet companies and their schools to help us identify young students of color or teachers who teach in the communities of color to help us identify the talent and then give them scholarships to train and give them access to really good training through our national training curriculum. And the reason we go through all this is that, well, now wait a minute, we're the nation's ballet company. And if ballet is going to get rid of this elitist thing, then we have to reflect the country. And let's face it, the country isn't white. It's about inclusion. 
And about a lack of opportunity. A lack, yeah, exactly. And it's really begun to work now, that partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. And, and of course, Misty, God bless her, she, she goes out there and, she, you know, on days off, she's, you know, for free going on the Boys and Girls Club. And, you know, she's aware that she is an avatar to that entire community. And she's embraced that. And it's great. But the thing that's also amazing is that when she comes here to work, it is her absolute priority. Nothing gets in the way. And as we're ending this, let's just go back to the NEA for a moment and the importance of the relationship between the NEA and ABT over the years. Over the years, what has NEA support meant to American Ballet Theater? You know, I would say at exactly the times that we needed it, it supported in a very large and generous portion exactly what it was that we needed to do to get the message and the power, the transformative power of this art form out to the broadest public. And in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was helping us tour. But in the 90s and on till now, it's focusing on the creations of new works, the things that will redefine the art form, the things that we might in fact be claiming will be the Swan Lake 100 years from now, that we, the NEA and ABT, created together. And and Kevin, what about the significance of the NEA to the cultural vitality of the country over the past 50 years? You know, I think that it's, it's certainly not what the European model is, but what it has addressed is the notion that the arts are an integral part of what it means to be a civilized society. That the performing arts, the visual arts, literature are the key to thinking in a language that is free to invent. If you will, I think part of the American entrepreneurial spirit, sort of daydreaming limitless ability to think up something new and take a chance on it, that's the type of thinking that immersion into the arts promotes. And that's what the NEA promotes. And finally, tell me the most rewarding aspect of your tenure as artistic director of ABT. That we're still here. Amen, and I am so glad. Well, that makes two of us, and thank you. Thank you, Kevin, I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's artistic director of American Ballet Theater, Kevin McKenzie. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. September 29th, 2015 marks our 50th anniversary. Check out our website for stories from around the country about the wonders of art or contribute one of your own. Go to arts.gov to find out how. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.